Hello everybody and welcome to my session at this brilliant Excel weekend event and I will be talking about the take and drop functions in Excel. Now these two data shaping functions are really really helpful and hopefully I'll provide some practical demonstrations in this session. Uh, my name is Alan Murray and I'm the founder of Computer Gaga. So just to move on to a little bit more information about me, I am based in the UK and I've been an Excel and now a Power BI trainer too for a long, long time. So this is what I do, this is what I like to do. And I, I still do quite a lot. I mean, almost every day I'm in some classroom or in some business providing hands-on training in addition to this other stuff I do, such as my YouTube channel, Computer Gaga, which has tons of free videos on, some books that I've authored, the Advanced Excel Success and Advanced Excel Formulas book, which has got over 800 pages stacked with Excel formulas. So no surprise, this session today was about formulas. And I'm also the organizer of the London Excel Meetup group, which is a free meetup based in London in person, but also done uh, virtually, so done online, and um, hopefully every month, you know, depending on how we can get organized and what's going on, such as events like this. And that is me, really. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn if you enjoy this session, or even if you didn't. Let's move on to this session. So the take and drop functions are data shaping functions and they're built for use on tables and arrays. So I guess arrays primarily, but tables being hopefully a common source in uh, Excel and the fact that they're dynamic, they're equally awesome with them. Now, as their names kind of suggest, the take function will take, it will return rows or columns from the start or end of a data set. So if you provide a positive number for how many rows or columns you want, it will take it from the start and a negative value will take them from the end. And the drop function does the same thing except it doesn't return them, it drops them. It removes those rows or columns from the start or end of that data set, which is likely to be somewhere based along a table or array. There's the syntax, quite simply provide it with that array, provide it with that data set, and then specify how many rows <laughs> or columns. And then finally, let's stop talking about it and let's actually see some examples. Let's go. Okay, so in this first examples, we're going to be using this data set, and this is a table. And this table, if we have a look at the table design tab, is named TBL product sales. So just looking at this, let's use a different color to that, that'll be much easier with my dark background, TBL product sales. So we're going to be referencing that as the array within our take or drop function. Now looking at the table, we can see that the first column is product names, and then we've got 12 months in the other columns. But we want to work on the idea that we don't know how many columns there are. We want this to be dynamic. So yes, there's 12 months right now, but there might only be six months next time, or eight months. Or imagining that this is this event is happening in January 2024, that may be the only column, the only month here. And we want to be dynamic. And the take and drop functions are fantastic for that. So looking at our report sheet, in this first example, I want to extract the names of the products. So in column B here, I want those product names. And you may recall, because we looked at the table just a few seconds ago really, that product is the first column. So this should be a nice easy task for us. 
in cell B3. I'm going to use the take function. And the take function will prompt for an array. Now for us right now, that's a table called TBL product cells. But it prompts for the array and how many rows or columns to uh, return because we're using the take function. So TBL product cells is the name of the table. I'll put in a comma and it'll move on to that rows argument. Let me just zoom in on that. Here I am on the rows argument, but I don't want to specify any rows. I'm after the first column and all of the rows. So I'll put in another comma and I'll specify a positive value of one. To remember positive numbers to take from the start, negative numbers to start taking from the end. So I'll close bracket and press enter on that and we've happily extracted those product names. Just quickly, if anybody thought that it might be taking the headers here, it will not because this is a table and the table will have that defined header row. If we're dealing with a range, then yes, we would encounter those problems. And that's one of many reasons why we rarely use ranges nowadays, unless we need something that is non-tabular. Okay, so that is done. Now we want to, in the next column along, extract the values for the last month. So currently in our data, if we go and look at it again to constantly remind ourselves, the last month in our data is December. But we don't know that. What's going to happen next month and a month after that and so on. We may not be at the end of the year. So we're not going to reference it explicitly in the way that something like an XLOOKUP or something would. We are just going to take the last one. So in goes the take function again in cell C3. And with this take function, I'll point it to TBL product sales. And a comma will move me on to the rows argument. Another one for the columns argument. And this time it is minus one because we're taking one column from the end. Great stuff. That will return those values. So we've got 136 for apple juice, 384 for burrito. And if we validate that by looking at the table, 136 apple juice here, let's zoom in, 384 for uh, burrito. So they are the correct values for that final month. So this is awesome. Uh, we can see just above that I have left C2 empty because that's going to be the header for that column and keeping this dynamic, we don't know what the name of the month is. So we're going to use the take function there as well. Equals take, the array is TBL product sales, but this time I need to isolate the header row. I want the header from the last column. So looking at this with the open square bracket, if I scroll down, when we're using this open square bracket to access elements of a table, the header row is one of those. In addition to extracting everything or taking the data without the header, which is what it does anyway, or the totals row or so on. So I'm gonna specify headers close off that square bracket and then as we were comma to move on to the rows argument comma for columns minus one and we will take that final month of December now to prove that this is all working and it's all dynamic I could go back to product sales I'm going to undo this next action as soon as I've done it but I could crazily select a bunch of columns here and just remove them temporarily. Don't be scared. And if I go back to report, I can see it now says August and I've got different values. So it's happily taking whatever the final column is. Let me just control Z that to bring back, uh, to undo and bring back those columns. 
Fantastic. Now, for those of you who are familiar with some kind of data shaping or array shaping, as many people refer to it, you may know of other shaping functions uh, like two col, two row, choose coals, choose rows, and also one called hstack. And what we could do if you wanted here is combine these two um, kind of independent array formulas, these two take functions into one with hstack, couldn't we? So to put that into practice, let me just expand the size of my formula bar. And I'm going to put in a uh, h stack here, h stack, and I'll do my alt enter. So I've got my first take function on the first row. I'll put in a comma. Now it maybe would have made sense for me to copy the second formula. So I could just paste it in in this moment. I've already done it once. But because I didn't, Alt Enter, A L T, Alt Enter for a new row. And I'm just going to write the take function in again. Seems like a good excuse to write formulas, doesn't it? TBL product sales, um, comma, comma, minus one. And then I'll make sure I'll put a close in bracket for HStack. So this is what I have. HStack is your horizontal stacking of arrays. So we're stacking columns on. And we've got our two here. We've got the one with the product names and the one with the uh, values for the final month and the beginning and end of HStack on their own lines. If I run this, I'm going to get an error. So this is working, or oh, it's not working, is it? But it's a good formula. <laughs> the problem being that I have this other formula still in place now remember these array formulas only exist in a single cell. So there's no real need for me to select all of them to delete, although you could. I can just select the first one in cell C3 and press delete and that spill range will then take up that space. And I've just converted the two formulas into one, which is, is nice, you know, I can still extract from them if I wanted using functions such as index or choose coals or obviously take and drop if I needed to extract you know, the first column from that array. Okay, so that's our first example of the take function so far, taking columns from the start and columns from the end. And at the moment, with the exception of the H stack there, we're writing them kind of on their own to return to the grid to return to the sheet. Let's look at how we can use them within other Excel functions. So we have seen that the take function can be used to take an entire column or columns from the end of a data set. And so far we've fed it into the grid or to another function such as HStack. But we could also feed that to an aggregation whether that be text join or whether that be the likes of sum, count or average. So in cell H2, maybe our goal is to sum the values for that last month or current month, you know, the last column. So in this scenario, if I put in the take function as previous, sum in the values, or sorry, take in the values from TBL product sales, comma comma minus one. So we know this takes that last column. It is the same formula that we used over here prior to putting that into the H stack. So if I press enter on this, I'm going to get a spill. So I can't you know, really see what's going on too well, but we're gonna wrap the sum function around this. So just before the take up in the formula bar here, I'm going to put sum. And as easy as that, by wrapping sum around take, I can now sum all of the values from the last column. Now, some of you might have thought that I was going to reference this column over here when I used my sum function, but I referenced TBL product sales as you know, trying to imagine that range is not there. 
and I'm going back to the initial source. However, for the purposes of learning, I absolutely could put in some function, use the take on that spill range, you know, the hash operator to access the spill range, ignore the rows argument, and minus one for that final column. So pressing enter now would give me the exact same value. Indeed, while we play with this, being that it's only a two column array, I could even achieve it by using a drop function. We haven't really covered drop uh, yet. And I could do minus, uh, sorry, I could do one. So I'm dropping the first column. It's only a two column array, so if I take the last one or drop the first one, it is the same. Okay, so we can write drop and take on existing spill ranges or whether it be arrays coming from functions or on a data source such as a table, which a few of these examples have been based on so far. And taking the last column in this case, but this can easily be uh, the last row as well. Everything I do here in columns can also be based on rows is a common question you know, for people to ask. They're trying to perform these aggregations for the last seven days or compare the last row to the penultimate row or the last column to the penultimate column. A, a kind of this month versus last kind of behavior. These are very common tasks and take and drop make those specific tasks very easy. Now that leads us on quite nicely to this next one where I am trying to sum again, but this could happily be an average or a median or some other aggregation, the last six months. So I think we know how this is done. I'm gonna throw the sum function in and just jump straight into this take function basing it on TBL product sales, comma, comma, minus six. So we're trying to get those, you know, last 13 months, last seven days, last six weeks, or in this case, six months, but that last N periods, such a common requirement. And yeah, the likes of take especially make it very simple. Some there for all the sales of all products for the last six months. Again, we can do exactly the same for rows. It's just in this example, our time-based data is horizontal, so we're working with columns. In this next example, we are going to sum all of the values for all 12 months, or however many there may be, for a specific product. So in cell G9, we have a drop down list for the different products in that table. So for example, I could choose cookies or I could choose hot dog and I would get the sum of all months values in the adjacent cell H9. Now looking back at the table, just to remind ourselves of its appearance. Now this is a table and I could select the 12 months in my uh, my formula to say, look, I wanna sum the values for all these 12 months. But we know that doing that is going to generate the range of Jan to December, which is not dynamic. So what we're going to do instead is bring in that drop function. And we're gonna use it to say, look, this is the table, use the entire data set, all values, but drop that first column. Now the sum function generally wouldn't be bothered by that column anyway, because it's text, but we're gonna work on this idea of dropping it, as I feel it would be more efficient to explicitly provide the correct range, rather than wondering whether it will work regardless. So let's go and do this, and to grab the correct month, so at the moment we're dealing with the hot dog values, we're going to be using the X lookup function. So back into our report and in cell H9, I'll start with the X lookup. So X lookup's going to look for the value in the adjacent cell, cell G9, 
currently saying hot dog. And the lookup array, well that's going to be TBL product sales. And I'm going to be looking down the product column. So look down that product column for that product. And for the return array, I want to provide all of the numbers. So at this point, as I mentioned prior, I could go and select all of these values. And if I keep it with this at the moment, and then we'll go back and edit it, I think that makes sense on our learning journey. But at the moment, it's looking at all of these months for the table, Jan to December. And this will work fine. It looks good, it is good. So if I close bracket on this and press enter, it's going to return all the values for those months. And just to show this working, if I change hot dog to a burrito, the values change as it returns the burrito values. And if I change it to melon, it returns melon values. So this X lookup is definitely working and I could throw a sum around that and it would sum them. But instead of specifying Jan to December, we want to bring in the drop function and say, look, just look at the entire table. That would be quite a concise way of referencing it as well instead of Jan to December. But drop the first column because the values are in every column except the first one. So let me return to this uh, return array and I'll put in my drop function. Now we've done a lot of takes here and we very briefly saw a drop example uh, a little while ago. But you can see the syntax is the same, prompting for the array, which is going to be TBL product sales, and then how many rows and or uh, columns you want to uh, drop. So I'm gonna remove this reference to the months after. You know, I'm gonna set the entire table, comma to move on to that rows argument, comma again to get out of there, and onto the columns argument, and then from there, one. Let's put an extra close bracket in for drop. The other bracket will belong to XLOOKUP. And this will return the same thing at the moment. If I press enter, I'll just get the same result. So I tweaked how I referenced it. Take the entire table except the first column versus Jan to December, and it results in the same. But from here, let's add in the sum function. So let's come back in here and throw a sum around that. Remember, this can be any function right now. And now I've summed all of the values for melon, which if I was to change that to chips, I get a different value, slightly different value. And if I changed it to pizza, I get uh, another different value. And in terms of its dynamism, if I went to product sales and ruthlessly removed some columns like I did earlier for a quick fire demo, back to report, the value is different. Okay, let's undo that and bring them back. So, uh, example of drop there, but uh, drop and take being used in other functions. This time it was an X lookup. I think it's fair to say everybody loves XLOOKUP, along with some, which is the best of them all. In this final example, we are going to write a much larger formula. This one's going to use the LET function to break our formula into more digestible chunks. So for this example, on screen, you can see that I have the value 10 in cell C2, and underneath that, the headers for country and total. Because I have a data set, which we'll see in a moment, and I want a distinct list of countries and their total sales. And I want to show only the top 10 of those countries. But because that 10 is coming from the value in C2, somebody can change that to the top eight or the top five, and I'll always receive that top N. So this is going to require a few functions 
hence the introduction of let. Now let's look at the data set. So this is it. I have a list and you can see multiple columns here. But most important of all is that we can see the country column in column D, shall we call it. This is a table, so we will not be referencing column D. We'll be referencing the country column. But you can see that there are many duplicates in here. We can see the likes of the USA, Germany and Finland been duplicated in just this screen so far. And that will continue. There are 21 countries in this list. Now we can also see the total column over on the right and that is the column that we will naturally be summing. And I want to sum for each country. But first of all we'll have to remove those duplicates. Then get a sum for each country in that distinct list and then ultimately find ourselves getting the top 10. Let's go and do it. So if I move out of here and back to my report page and in the formula bar, let me give myself another line maybe, let's begin the let function and alt enter for a new line. Okay, so for the first name, and for anyone who may not have used the let function actually, let me quickly explain that the let function is used to make your formulas more meaningful and also faster. Because we can assign values and calculations to names. So calculation really is just a value, but a calculated value to a name. And especially if that calculation would occur more than once in a formula, by doing it once and assigning it to a name makes more efficient formulas. But we will assign these to a name and then ultimately get to the calculation, which is always the final argument of let. So for this first name, I'm going to call it distinct countries. Just double check my type in there. And with a comma, I will now provide the value to that name. And I'm going to use the unique function so that I can use TBL cells, country column, and get a distinct list by using the uh, default method of unique here. You know, that I want that distinct list of country names. So that's one name done. The, the distinct list of countries assigned to the name distinct countries. Let's do another. I've already got my comma on the end, so I'm ready to move into the next one. Okay, Alt Enter. Next up is going to be the values. So what am I going to uh, call this? Um, I'll call it, I've completed, uh, total values mind blank on thinking of names, comma. Okay, this is going to be the sum ifs function. If you still use sum if, time to move on guys. Sum ifs does one or more. Let's always go sum ifs in that contest. It also prompts you for the sum range first, which is awesome. And that will be TBL sales total column, total column, yes. Criteria range, well that's going to be a TBL sales country. And then for the criteria, that is actually the previous uh, name of distinct countries. So notice that that name appears in a list, which is fantastic. It has a, a slightly different icon to the function surrounding it right now. Just a single X and not the FX. And yeah, this is what we've got. I'm summing the total column from TBL sales. If the country in that sales table is equal to whatever's in the distinct countries uh, list. So it will be implied here. You know, you might be thinking, but that's multiple countries. That's 21 countries that you said, Alan. So yes, 
Uh, but we will work through these, you know, some from the first one, some from the next one, some from the next one. Doesn't matter what order they come in. I haven't sorted them. So they're going to be in the order that they they are in the list. I think the first country was France, I think. So that would be like the first one. It doesn't matter. We're, we're going to sort it later in the formula. Okay, but for now it's distinct countries. And I'll close off some ifs, put in a comma, and off we go again, alt tab. Because next up, another name, it's up to you how you kind of break this up or, or not at all. But I've decided to break into three names before I ultimately use the take function, which is what this is all about for the top 10. But next up, I want to combine them. So I want to use that H stack again, and I also want to bring in sort to sort them. But H stack first, or H stack second because it's first to e execute. So I'm going to use the sort function. Well, actually hang about, I haven't even named it yet. Right, what am I gonna name this? Um, results. Uh, my mind is not working for good names. Sort, H stack. I'm gonna stack the distant, distinct countries. So this is me at the moment. I've got my results naming and I've got a sort H stack combination and so far distinct countries is the first column of this horizontal stacking. You know, so referencing this up here guys, yeah? The distinct countries. Okay, comma. Next up is going to be the total values. That second name, close bracket on H stack, comma two, comma, and then a minus one ultimately. So got the total sales in there. So there's the two columns that are being horizontally stacked. And off the back of that, I can do sort to sort by the second column of that stacked array, which is total values as we know it. I've then got the comma in so that I can reference descending order. Descending by the value, you know, highest total first, best best uh, value first, and down. So minus one, close bracket, comma, alt, enter. See why I expanded that formula bar. Now it's calculation time. And now it's time for hopefully someone we're getting quite familiar with, which is going to be take and I'm going to take from results so that array is what we're taking from results being you know that that name that we assigned previously uh, so we're just kind of building off it here uh, for rows this time first 10 rows I nearly moved on to columns because we've been doing so much of that in this video but this is a positive 10. It is the first 10 rows. Now I'm gonna do Alt Enter for one more bracket, which does mean my formula bar was one line short. There we go. This is the finishing formula. I will provide copies of this completed Excel file as well. You'll have both the uh, the incomplete and the complete both available uh, for those of you watching this kind of live the live showing of this recording or the re or the replay okay running this here we go this is awesome so we've got the top 10 countries not much more to say on that that is brilliant now you might be thinking at this point, Alan, you, you, you typed in 10, I can see that works, but you did say that you were going to use the value in C2. So yes, what I should do at this point now is replace that 10 from the formula with the reference to C2 to bring in that, uh, that interactive nature. So let me change 10. Oh dear, I've messed that up. I'm in the wrong cell. Here we go. 
10 to the C2. And if I press enter, nothing changes. But we know that I can change that 10 to a five and get the top five or to an eight and get the top eight and so on. Now, something I did not tell you in advance here, I held something back. And that is, and hey, if you're playing with the file I provided, you may even have noticed this. I tip my cap, even though I'm not wearing one, to you. In cell B2, there's a drop down. We can change it from top to bottom and nothing happens. Uh, so we better build into our formula a little conditional test at the end that if somebody selects top from the drop down, we should do the top N. And if they choose bottom, it should be the bottom end. Let's do that. Remember, dynamic arrays, they're only in that first cell. Everything else is a spill range. That kind of caught me uh, a bit a moment ago, didn't it? So in there, back into the formula, I'm going to use a function called switch. So I'm hoping that although this presentation has all been about take and drop, and those functions are relatively new and maybe relatively unsung, but I've managed to include quite a few functions in here from XLOOKUP to SUM to unique, sum ifs, sort, hstack. There's, there's been a few more coming into play. And now we have one called switch, another unsung formula really. I mean, I understand why if gets the majority of the credit, but switch is, is possibly underused. Anyway, here we go, it's good for this. I've only got two options, top or bottom. You could argue if it's easier, but I'm gonna go for the switch option because here I can mention that expression just once, the expression being uh, B2 right now. And I want to say that if B2 has the value of top, then we'll be doing what we're already asked it to do. So if the expression is equal to uh, of B2 is equal to the value of top, double check your typing, then the result will be what we're already asking it to do. It will be the top n. Uh, let me take a copy of that little take function there. And I'll put in a comma. And for the next value, if it says bottom, it will be that same kind of formula, but a negative sign in there. So there's the one for top, do that. And then we've got, um, if it says bottom, then do this. And I've got that negative sign uh, just before the C2 there to say we're gonna be taking the last N rows. Yeah, remember negative from the end. Uh, this, I think, is the first time in this presentation that we're working off rows rather than columns but you can see the same applies to what we have seen when we've done those examples of last six months, last column, first column, all that stuff. All right, I think this is good to go. Just looking at the colors of my brackets, making sure they're level, and if I press enter, it works. But if I change top with my drop down in B2 to bottom, I do indeed get the bottom values. Uh, so top is top and bottom is bottom. And if I change it to 10, yes, here we go. So threw in a little switch there so we can switch between two different take functions, whether we're going from the top or the bottom. So that's it from me. Thank you for watching. And I hope you enjoy the rest of this tremendous Excel event that is put on by the team there. If you're interested in connecting with me, then you can find me probably on LinkedIn or on YouTube are your best bets, or to come and find me at the London Excel Meetup. 
You can also see me on Instagram and on X, although I'm not so active in, in the social space outside of the likes of YouTube. If you're interested in learning more Excel formulas, check out my advanced Excel formula book that has over 550 examples of Excel formulas. So I hope to see you around at another event sometime soon. Take care of yourself. Bye for now.